Okay, this continues musical instruments. At the end of my last series of lectures, I described acoustical amplification. First of all, with a well-made instrument, a well-made instrument, when the body of the instrument vibrates, it will always produce a series of Shalodny patterns, a pattern of nodes and anti-nodes on the body of the instrument itself. A well-made instrument will do this equally for every note that is played. However, in addition to that, there is another way to amplify the sound, and that's by means of a sound box, which is an example of what is called a resonant chamber. Now, a resonant chamber, a nice easy example to picture, would be the actual chamber associated with the body of, say, an acoustical guitar or a violin or something like that. Here's the basic idea of what happens with a resonant chamber. Okay, first of all, you set the instrument itself into vibration, as I previously have described. With a string instrument, you pluck a guitar string. With a keyboard, you hit a key, which then hits a wire which vibrates, like in a piano, for example or you blow into the instrument with a woodwind or a brass instrument, or you just simply hit the instrument as you would with percussion. But somehow you set the instrument itself into vibration. Okay, now the vibrating instrument will then literally set up a standing wave of air inside of the chamber. And then for a well-made instrument, an anti-node for that standing wave of air appears at the opening of the instrument. And then therefore, ultimately you hear a nice loud, clear tone. So after an instrument is set into vibration, it creates, the vibrating instrument does, it creates a standing wave of air inside the sound box or inside the resonant chamber. An anti-node where that standing wave of air appears at the open end. Producing loud, clear tone. And then a well-made instrument will do this equally with every note that is played, in addition to producing all the Shalani patterns and so on, as I previously have described. So a well-made instrument. We'll do this. Okay, let me go ahead and demonstrate for you various sound boxes. I'm going to do so first of all in the following way. Okay, I have a graduated cylinder here filled with water, and then I have a tuning fork. The fundamental frequency of this tuning fork is going to be 384 hertz. Ignore the really high-pitched sound when I do this. Instead, what we're going to be listening for is this, like so. Now here's how I'm gonna amplify that sound by means of a resonant chamber. I have here a graduated cylinder that is filled with water, and then I have this metal pipe which I'm then gonna subsequently immerse into the water like so. And then right here is gonna be my resonant chamber. If I get the length of the chamber just right, then I will set up, set up rather a standing wave of air, a standing sound wave inside the chamber itself. And then if I get the length just right, an anti-node will appear at the open end. This will nice, then result in a nice, loud, clear tone. That sounds like this. Like so. So I created a standing wave of air, a standing sound wave here inside of the chamber, and an anti-node here appeared at the open end. Okay, here are a few other versions of exactly the same thing. So here's another tuning fork that I'm gonna use for this demonstration. And then this right here is gonna be my sound box. It's just a rectangular box and it's completely empty. There's nothing there. 
So I'm going to go ahead and strike the tuning fork and then set it here into the box like so. And I then therefore amplify the sound. So not only is the tuning fork vibrating, but the entire box is vibrating. That sets up a standing sound wave here inside the chamber, and an anti-node here appears at the open end. Once again, that sounds like this. Like so. Okay, once again, here are a few other versions of exactly the same thing. Next, I'm going to show you a couple of simple examples of woodwind instruments, some whistles. This right here is a whistle, and it's capable of only playing two notes. It consists of nothing more than a mouthpiece, and it's a rectangular box that's completely empty. I'm going to first of all play this whistle as what is called an open pipe. With an open pipe, it's a specific type of resonant chamber, you have two open ends here and here, and an anti-note appears at the two open ends. That then sounds like this, like so. So I set the instrument itself into vibration by blowing into it, and then the vibrating instrument sets up a standing sound wave inside the chamber. Okay, now I can only play one other note here with this whistle, and that's instead of playing an open pipe, instead now I'm going to play what is called a closed pipe. A closed pipe occurs when I cap one end. When I cap one end, I still have an open end here, so an anti-node of the standing wave of air appears here, but over here, I have a node. The reason why I have a node is because there's a wall here now that literally present, prevents rather the air molecules from vibrating. And that then sounds like this. Like so. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch whistles. When I switch whistles, I'm gonna go ahead and then therefore change the length of the chamber. You would do this on an ordinary woodwind or brass instrument by pressing keys like on a clarinet, for example, when you do your changing the length of the pipe itself, your opening and closing valves within the body of the instrument, when you press the keys, for example, say, on a clarinet. So once again, here is this whistle, first of all, as an open pipe, and then secondly, as a closed pipe, like so, and now I'm gonna switch whistles. This right here is the bass. So with this bass, it has a much longer length associated with its pipe. This then results in lower frequency sounds. So first of all, I'm gonna play it as an open pipe. That then sounds like this, like so. And then secondly, I'll play it as a closed pipe. That then looks like this and sounds like this, like so. Okay, now even though the geometry of such an instrument, like with a brass instrument, may be quite complicated, when we draw out these open and closed pipes, we do so with a very simplified geometry. We essentially draw rectangular chambers. So first of all, here's the basic idea as to what is happening within an open pipe. By the way, as I'm erasing the board here, and as I'm thinking about it, you, of course, have your own resonant chamber when you speak. Your resonant chamber is your voice box. It's your larynx, like so. So, for example, as I speak to you right now, I can pressing down on my larynx as I do, and I can feel it vibrating. So then, therefore, I have a resonant chamber such that an antinote appears at the open end. That, of course, is my mouth, resulting in a nice, loud, clear tone. Typically, it is a lot easier for you to speak while you're exhaling as opposed to inhaling. If you ever tried to speak while inhaling, it's not exactly easy to do. But when you speak, you do so as you exhale. Okay. At any rate, however, okay, getting back to the basic uh, situations involving, first of all, open and closed pipes. Okay, so very simply, we just draw a rectangular box, like so, and it has here a length L associated with it. Now, once again, you end up with a standing wave of air inside the chamber, literally a standing sound wave. Remember, however, that sound is a longitudinal wave. So then, therefore, the air molecules here and here at either of the open ends, they're vibrating back and forth like so with their largest possible amplitudes, resulting then in a light, nice, loud, clear tone. Mathematically, however, we represent this as a cosine curve, for example, that is drawn like so. And then half a period later, it oscillates to here. 
So once again, what's really happening is that the air molecules are doing this. However, we represent this mathematically as a standing cosine curve, for example, or sine curve. It doesn't matter which, that is oscillating like so. Now notice how much of a wavelength I have drawn here in this space from crest to trough. Right here in the space L is one half wavelength. Okay, let me draw the next harmonic. When I do, you'll start to see a simple pattern emerge that is very similar to what we saw with standing waves on a string. Okay, now I'm going to keep the same length L here. Like so, but the next harmonic frequency is going to have to have a wave form inside the open pipe that looks like this. Like so, and then half a period later, it oscillates to here. Notice that the wavelength here is smaller than it is on the diagram above. This then means that the frequency is going to be greater. We'll get to the harmonic frequencies in just a few minutes. But notice here in the space L, we have here one full wavelength, which I'm going to go ahead and write like this. So now when I draw one more harmonic, you'll get the idea. As I do, once again, I'm, I'm not going to change the space L. Keep it the same. Okay, so for the next harmonic then, once again, you have to have an antinode appearing at the two ends. That will then have to look like this. Like so. And then half a period later, it oscillates to here. Like so. So once again, you have antinodes at the two open ends. In this case, we have one and a half wavelengths that are present. So then therefore, in the space L, we have here lambda, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we end up with a little pattern expression here, just like we did for standing waves on strings, and it looks exactly the same as we did in that case. And lambda over 2. So then therefore, when you have an open pipe that is resonating, literally a standing sound wave, then ultimately in the space L, you have to have multiples of half wavelengths. So right here is pretty obviously n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on. Okay, there's also a pattern, of course, associated with the frequencies that comes from the following. Okay, v equals lambda times frequency. Okay, frequency is V over lambda. The lambda is 2L over N. Plug that here into the denominator of the expression. Like so. And then just simply move the N up to the numerator. When you do, you end up with this expression here which is once again the exact same pattern expression for the frequencies associated with standing waves on a string. This right here for n equals 1 is the fundamental frequency, v over 2L. It's also known as the first harmonic frequency. This guy right here is the second harmonic frequency, 2V over 2L, also known as the first overtone. This right over here is the third harmonic frequency, 3V over 2L, also known as the second overtone, and so on and so on. It's important to realize, however, that the V in all of this, you have no control over. It's the speed of the sound wave. It's the speed of sound, 343 meters per second. So this is why woodwinds and brass instruments are not nearly as versatile as stringed instruments. Okay, for stringed instruments, remember that the V was the speed of the wave on the string. That's controlled by the tension and the density of the string itself. You have control over those variables. However, when you play a woodwind or a brass instrument, the V you have no control over. That's the speed of sound, 343 meters per second. So the only things that you can control when playing a woodwind or a brass instrument are the length of the chamber itself. You do so by pressing keys on the instrument with open and closed valves, and by changing the shape of your lips for some specific types of instruments or using different types of mouthpieces for those instruments, like with an oboe or a trumpet or something like that. In some cases, you can change the value of N by changing the shape of your lips and also by changing, for example, the mouthpiece itself on the instrument. However, this is ultimately an explanation as to why those types of instruments are not nearly as versatile as they are as stringed instruments. 
Okay, now this is what happens for an open pipe. It's a little bit different for what happens for what is called a closed pipe. Okay, so for closed pipes, once again, we just draw a rectangular box, but I'm gonna keep the L the same as I did before. So typically we draw it like this. Okay, now here's what's happening with the actual air molecules themselves. Right over here at the open end, you have the air molecules oscillating back and forth like so at their largest possible amplitude. So you get an antinode. But here at the closed end, you have a wall. This constrains the air molecules from vibrating. So then therefore you have to have a node here appearing at the closed end. Therefore, for the fundamental frequency, the waveform that appears here in this chamber looks like this. Node, antinode, and then half a period later, it oscillates to here. It's a little bit tricky to see on this diagram, but notice how much of a wavelength here we have in the space L. It's one quarter of a wavelength. The full wave, for example, would look like this. Like so. Okay, let me draw the next two harmonics. Once again, I'll keep the space L the same. So same L as before. When I draw this, you once again have to have a node at the closed end and an anti-node at the open end. Therefore, this looks like this. And then half a period later, oscillates to here. So node and anti-node. Notice that the amount of the wavelength that I have there in the space L is three quarters of a wavelength. Now I'll just draw one more here. You'll get the idea of what I do. Once again, the same space L as before. Therefore, for the next harmonic, it's the same L, by the way, as I did before. Let me draw it roughly the same length. Okay, then therefore you have to have the following appear. Like so, and then half a period later, it oscillates to here. Like so. If you look carefully there, notice that I have here a full wavelength and then an additional one quarter. So then therefore in the space L, we have five quarters lambda and so on. So what you have to have appear here for a closed pipe are odd multiples of quarter wavelengths. So we have to use an odd multiplier in order to describe that. In the space L, the odd multiplier looks like this. So when n is equal to zero, then you end up with a one here in the parentheses, and that's this quantity here. Okay, when n is equal to one, you end up with three here in the parentheses, that's this quantity here. And then lastly, of course, this right here is n is equal to two, where you have in the parentheses, parentheses there a total of five. So you have to have odd multiples of quarter wavelengths. Okay, there's also a pattern associated with the frequencies. The pattern, once again, comes from this expression here. Okay, the lambda is going to be 4L divided by the parentheses. So stick that down here into the denominator of the expression. And then move the parentheses up to the numerator. So then, then therefore, the harmonic frequencies are odd multiples of the quantity V over 4L. This is, by the way, where the terminology for the closed pipe starts to get a little bit confusing. For N is equal to zero, the frequency here is V over 4L. This is referred to as the fundamental frequency, still called uh, the first harmonic frequency. And then right over here, when N is equal to one, the frequency here is 3V over 4L. But we still call this the second harmonic frequency. It's still referred to as the first overtone. This guy down here has a frequency of 5V over 4L. So the harmonic frequencies then for a closed pipe are odd multiples of the quantity V over 4L. So getting back to my whistles demonstrations, basically you were hearing the two fundamental frequencies. You were hearing V over 2L for the open pipe and V over 4L for the closed pipe. So for example, for my small whistle, here is the open pipe. This is V over 2L, like so, and then half as much. 
here's V over 4L. Like so, same thing for my large whistle as well. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude part one here of today's series of lectures. At this point, what I want you to do is now take a look at the short video that I have filmed for you in today's folder called the Rubens Tube Demonstration. So look at that now, please. I'm gonna go ahead and stop this film here.